everybody. Welcome to another episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kafinas. Today, I speak with Ari Paul. Ari is co-founder and CIO of Block Tower Capital, one of a number of newly minted hedge funds focused exclusively on the cryptocurrency space. He was previously a portfolio manager for the University of Chicago's $8 billion endowment and a derivatives market maker and proprietary trader for Susquehanna International Group. In our most recent episode with crypto fund manager Chris Berniski, we learned about the models that some of the most forward-looking investors are using to value crypto assets. In this episode, we learn how to trade them. How does a crypto fund manager manage risk? And what are the existential risk factors to such a new and fledgling market? What are the benchmarks for measuring performance? Is it Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, or the broader equity markets? How do you seek alpha in an already uncorrelated asset? And how might the flood of institutional capital alter these correlations? What does a consolidation in cryptocurrencies look like? Are we verging near a collapse in valuations? And if so, what sorts of tools are available for shorting an overheated market? We look at cash settled futures, the use of put and call options, and consider how to protect ourselves from counterparty and exchange risk. Finally, we examine some of the most interesting and creative investment opportunities for making money in this emerging market and what you can do to take advantage of them. As always, you can join our email list by visiting the show's website at hiddenforcespod.com. If you listen to Hidden Forces on your iPhone or Android, make sure to subscribe. If you like the show, write us a review. And if you want a sneak peek into how each episode is made or for special storylines told through pictures and questions, then like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod. And now let's get right to this week's conversation. Ari, welcome to Hidden Forces. Thanks for having me, Dimitri. It's great having you here. So why don't we start with uh, your background? How did you get into this space? So my background was first as a trader at Susquehanna International Group as a market maker, commodity, FX, trading kind of anything and everything, and then as an asset allocator at University of Chicago Endowment. So I think of it as kind of the two far end of the extremes of investing. One is the very short-term trading, and the other is long-term asset allocation. So how would you describe what you're doing now? So I run a crypto investment firm that has one product, which is a hedge fund. And it's definitely more active trading focused than most crypto investment funds in the space. And what that means is we do a lot of event-driven trading, for example. We'll, we'll make trades based on hard forks or conference events. So I think of it as really the intersection of an understanding of cryptocurrency fundamentally with the trader mindset of always looking for edge. What is our alpha? What edge do we have over the competition, over the market? How many partners do you guys have? So I, I have one co-founder as partner, and then we, we currently have a team of eight people in total. Hmm. There are a lot of funds now kind of opening up in this space. And you guys, am I correct, you raised $140 million in one particular round with Unisquare Ventures and Andreessen Horowitz? We actually raised much less. We launched with only less than $10 million back in August. Uh, hmm. we, we raised another uh, roughly 40 after that. And then we grew to that 140 number very quickly, okay. just because, frankly, the whole market was up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of interest in this space. So that kind of gets to the question I wanted to ask you right off the bat, which is what type of returns are you looking for? Like, what are you looking to, to gain in this market? So very broadly, what I'm trying to accomplish is really to capture the upside of cryptocurrency with far, far less risk. And what that means in practice is when we have a period like in the last quarter, the cryptocurrency market as a whole was up roughly 2x. Uh, it depends on which kind of things you look at. But if you look at Bitcoin um, and kind of the large caps, it was up 2x, 3x. So our, our focus is really during a raging bull market, we want to capture that for investors. But we're really focused on the fact that they're bear markets too. And this mm -hmm. is a market that a bear market does not mean down 10 or 20%, it can mean down 80%. So we're really focused on mitigating mitigating risk, mitigating that downside. So when people talk about your target return, to me as an investor, that's actually a really bad question. I don't, tar I don't believe in targeting return. I don't think you can target return. I think what you can do is target risk. Mm -hmm. And so we try to really minimize the risk of ruin to bring the probability of, of say, a 60% drawdown as close to zero as we can. Mm -hmm. And then within that constraint, we're trying to maximize. And what that means in practice is when there's tremendous opportunities, we're trying to make every penny we can. Mm. But if you tell me that there's going to be a bear market that's going to last a year and everything's going to be down 70% and maybe the arbitrage opportunities go away and maybe it's hard to generate alpha. My goal in that scenario is to lose as little as possible. My target return might be zero. So you, there are a number of really interesting points you bring up there. One is that the, you're touching on this, this thing of benchmarks, which is that traditionally a hedge fund gets graded on how you perform if you outperform the market. But in this case, you don't just have to outperform the market. You also have to outperform the cryptocurrency space in general, right? 
Yeah, no one's impressed. I mean, so cryptocurrency is probably whole, Bitcoin too. Yeah, so I mean, in a period where crypto is up 100, percent no one's impressed that you outperform Treasury bonds or even equities. Right. So it's a really challenging question. What is the benchmark? Because the simple answer might be say Bitcoin, but a year ago Bitcoin was 75 percent of the market. Now Bitcoin's about 30 percent. Well, what if Bitcoin falls to five percent? What if Ethereum conquers the world? What if something that as yet uninvented conquers the world? None of our investors are going to be happy that Bitcoin went to zero, let's say, and we were down 90 percent. You know, no one's going to be happy about that. So I like to joke that we're benchmarked against whatever wins with hindsight bias. Hmm. Well, that's interesting too, right? Because if it's something that hasn't been invented yet, how do you guys get exposure to that? And we'll get we'll get into that because I mean, well, there's like tons of interesting questions I had for you. So getting back to return and risk. There's a lot of volatility in this market. That's one of the things that makes it really attractive. And we'll get into sort of how you can play that volatility and capture a lot of the spreads there because there are many. But that's obviously something where your investors have to be aware of that level of volatility. And what are your, can you talk about lockup provisions and like how do you like manage your capital? Is it the same as any other hedge fund or? Sure. So the regulatory rules in the space, you're really not supposed to talk about an investment vehicle. But what I can talk about is our investment approach, which is almost the same thing. Hmm. And the idea there is just you're not supposed to market, really. So the way I like to approach the space, the way I want to invest my own money, frankly, and that's how we do everything. It's very much most of my own money is invested with us, and I want to invest our investors' money the same way my own money is invested. And the thinking there is... I'm very confident in both the beta tailwind. I'm confident the cryptocurrencies as a whole will succeed. I'm very confident in our ability to find high alpha opportunities. By the, just to clarify for our audience, by the beta tailwind, you're talking about the exposure to the cryptocurrency market in general and basically getting catching that entire wave and then also having the opportunity to rewards on top of that beta with alpha, which is what you're referring to there. Exactly, exactly. So total cryptocurrency network value, I'm confident it's going to be higher. Now, when I say confident, it doesn't mean it's a sure thing, but that's the bet we're making. That's the bet anyone who invests mm-hmm. with us is making. Mm-hmm. If, if you think cryptocurrency is going to zero, you don't allocate to cryptocurrency. And, then, and we are confident that it is an inefficient market and there's opportunity. So I say that. So what's our focus? Our focus is that's why we're, we're inordinately focused on avoiding those big drawdowns, mm-hmm. because it's this idea that as long as we're in the game, we're going to end up happy in right. three years. So exactly. we want to make sure that we stay in the game. And that means avoiding blowups of any sort, and that means extreme drawdowns due to market risk. It also means security, right? So avoiding having our assets stolen. It means counterparty risk. So if I had all of my assets sitting on one exchange and that exchange gets taken down or hacked or, or okay. bankrupt, so we're very focused on making sure that we don't have any extreme losses. So you're, you're like touching on all these questions that I already have for you, Ari, mm-hmm. and you're throwing me off a little bit. <laughs> but I definitely want to get into exchange risk and counterparty risk in general. Also, I'm curious to what extent you can use leverage given the liquidity in this market. But before that, why don't we take a step back here? Why don't you walk me through your investment framework, sort of what you feel differentiates both crypto funds in general and this industry? Because one of the things I was thinking about, and this brings us back to beta and alpha, is that if, you know, traditional fund managers, some fund managers might be trying to get exposure to cryptocurrencies. In fact, I heard you mention this yourself about, you know, when you were at the endowment, that it would have been potentially a good move. Certainly, in hindsight, it would have been a good move for the Chicago the school endowment to have some exposure to Bitcoin and then, in fact, or to cryptocurrencies, that in fact, this provides a certain, to quote to my friend Christopher Cole, it's like adding Dennis Robin to your portfolio. It gives you exposure to convexity. Now, you're already in the cryptocurrency market, and that brings back to beta, like, which is your beta? So, I don't know. Walk me through your, your framework here. And yeah. feel free to geek out with me here on Sure, this. sure. So there's no right answer to the product that investors want to invest in. So within the asset allocator seat, a question we often asked at the endowment was, do we want the hedge fund manager or investor to be responsible for timing the market or for deciding? So for example, let's say you write a check to a real estate manager. Is it their responsibility to foresee the 2007 and 8 downturn in real estate? Of course, Ari. Uh, didn't you know that? Uh, well, the challenge, though, is is you look, <laughs> at, look at it from the other side. Let's say I'm an endowment and I want 10% of my portfolio in real estate, and I write the check to the real estate manager, and the real estate says, you know what? We think things are frothy. We're going to hold 80% cash. They've kind of destroyed my allocation decision, mm-hmm. right? So it was my decision to decide how much I want to allocate to real estate. I see what you're saying. So there's an argument to say that that the job of a fund manager is to do the best they can relative to the benchmark, relative to right. you know a person who invested in them is deciding how much risk they want to take. Do they want to invest 2% of their net worth or 10% in that asset class? That's fine. We don't do that. So what we say is there's a lot of people who, unlike in traditional asset classes, most people feel like they have some sense of equities, right? We all know what a PE ratio is. Mm-hmm. Most people who invest in a real estate fund have some sense of real estate and valuation. Most of the people who invest in cryptocurrency, including a fund like ours, kind of know that they don't know. And they're looking for us to make not only the kind of alpha decisions, but also the beta. They also want us to time the market. And 
again, not I'm not saying that's the right answer for every every fund and every firm, but that is what we do. So we typically hold a lot of cash. We target something like 40% cash on okay. average. We trade in and out of that aggressively. So you asked about leverage. So no, I, I want to deleverage because mm. cryptocurrency is so, so volatile mm-hmm. and so risky. Kind of is leveraged already. Incre- it's almost like <laughs> it's a, a call. Leverage, but... It's like a call. And so I'm far more comfortable managing a portfolio that's a little bit deleveraged. And I'm very confident that there's enough alpha opportunities that we're still going to end up producing really, really attractive returns for investors despite having that cash drag. So you said it's like a call. Are you able to use puts and calls in this market? You can. So I believe that I have actually personally traded the majority of all the calls that have traded in the space. And that sounds like a silly statement, but the reality <laughs> is that almost no options have traded. So we did a, a million dollar options trade that in our minds was not a big trade or meaningful trade. It was a very small percentage of the portfolio. You cornered the market. Getting, uh, well, it was funny because it, it got written up on by the Wall Street Journal as anonymous trader makes massive million dollar bet that Bitcoin I will go to fifty thousand dollars. I saw that, um, and I read that, and it was like disbelief. It was like, oh, that was like just a, a tiny bet for us. But also, it didn't properly capture. Also, can you explain to our audience how put works and how a call works, what the difference is, and how you would use it, and why that doesn't necessarily reflect that you're going long. You know that you need a payout of fifty thousand price of Bitcoin in order for your fund to, to be successful or to have a successful quarter or whatever. Sure, sure. So a call is the right but not the obligation to buy something. A put is the right but not obligation to sell something. So let's use a concrete example. So if Microsoft's trading at $20, I can buy the $25 Microsoft call maybe for, let's say, $2. So if Microsoft goes to $30, I then have the right to buy Microsoft stock for $25. I paid $2 for that right. I then get to sell Microsoft stock at 30 so I make $5 minus $2, I get $3 of profit. So a call is potentially a less risky way to have access to upside. You're kind of borrowing money from the person that you're getting the stock from, not the kind stock of. from, yeah. So, so it can be a way to get leverage. It can be, yeah, it can be capital efficient. It can be a way to limit your downside risk. So in that scenario, the most I'm risking is $2. If Microsoft goes to zero, I still lose $2. But I think something that people often miss is there's this term called put call parity. So the way you actually price a put in a call, I'm going to oversimplify, a put is a call because you can trade the underlying and convert one into the other. Mm -hmm. So what that means is I can buy a call, I can then short stock, and it is identical to if I bought a put. Mm -hmm. So to an options trader, a call is not a bet on something going up. Mm. A call is a bet on volatility. And the reason for that is I can buy a call, short the stock, and hedge out the delta. I can hedge out the upside exposure. So what am I really betting on if I buy a call? I'm betting that the stock is going to move a lot. And I don't care if it goes up or down, I'm Mm -hmm. betting that it's just going to move a lot. Mm -hmm. Then there's kind of the second derivative. So not only am I betting that it's going to move a lot around where it is now, if I buy a deep out of the money call, so instead of buying that $30 Microsoft call, let's say I buy the $80 Microsoft call. Mm. The way that's priced relative to the $30 call is a bet on the shape of the distribution. There's a term called fat tails or kurtosis. So that $50,000 strike call, so what I did is I bought basically a million dollars of calls that settled at the end of 2018 that are the $50,000 strike in Bitcoin. I did that when Bitcoin was trading around $18,000. And so one way to think about it is I'm betting Bitcoin will go higher, but I could just buy Bitcoin if I want to make that bet. And I can hedge that part of the calls. Another way to frame it is that I'm betting that Bitcoin is going to be very, very volatile. If it goes down a lot, that Mm. call actually makes me money because I own less Bitcoin because I have the call. Mm. So I lose less on the way down Mm. by owning the call. Then there's another way to look at it, which was definitely part of my thinking, which is an idea of the shape of the distribution. Just to clarify also, I think this is an important point for anyone that's listening. This is why these are tools that, I mean, and this gets us to one of my sub headings in this rundown is Boy Plunger. I told you I, I have a few quotes from Jesse Livermore because I think there's a great advantage right now in this market for people that understand how to use these tools. And then my question really is also, again, sorry not to interrupt you and then go all over the map, but you're saying so many things that I don't want to miss out on. I'm curious how you're able to apply this toolbox, right? Because this is a very sophisticated level of risk management that you're talking about here and how you apply these tools and also how that toolbox might expand. Because I'm thinking right now you're talking about using options and I'm wondering, you know, how do you deal with margin calls in this environment and given just the liquidity and illiquidity and all that sort of stuff. So that gets me to wondering, like, you've got a tremendous amount of knowledge and you're a very creative thinker. You know, I've listened to a few of your interviews and that has come across to me. So I I think someone like you, I feel like you're in this market and you're probably able to stretch the boundaries of what you, you're probably pushing up right up against what you can do in terms of all the different tools that are available. And I really wonder how you see that toolbox maybe growing, expanding and how that's factoring in. Sorry to kind of jump in there, but I wanted to get that out there before I forgot. Yeah, no problem. So what we've been seeing for the last year, and and I think is only going to accelerate, is professionalization of the space and many more tools coming online. So six months ago, if you wanted to short, really the only way to do it was within an exchange. So there were exchanges that gave you the ability to short. That was very unattractive. Like Ledger X? 
Well, Ledger X didn't even exist, but like Poloniex or Bitfinex mm. offered the ability to short on their exchange. Mm. The problem with that, though, was you have to post full collateral. You're borrowing from that exchange. Those exchanges tend to be risky. Mm. So they're not CFTC regulated. The nature of facilitating margin means there's a risk of blow up of the exchange. So some of them are things like socializing losses. Right. They tend to have flash crashes very frequently because there's people who can get margin called on those exchanges. And because they're generally relatively unregulated and relatively opaque, it'd be really, really tough for an investor to say, I trust them with $50 million, right? So it might be fine for a retail investor to say, okay, I'll put 10 grand on there. Right. But how do you trust them with a huge sum of money? So six months ago, for the professional investor in the space, I'd say shorting was almost impossible. It was very hard to do it prudently. Now we have things like Bitcoin futures, which right. makes shorting much, much easier. Which is cash settled, and that's very different than what we're talking about here. Correct. And so, I'm curious, sort of, if you can tell me, as we move forward, how you might be able to use those what are the correlations between those markets, and are they at risk of breaking down in a way that, are, that we wouldn't be able to foresee given how new the market is? Sure. A ton of great questions there. So first on, on the toolkit, so LedgerX I think of as somewhere in between. They're CFTC regulated, very professionally run, but they don't have a huge balance sheet. They're entirely a Bitcoin business. They're one of the biggest hacking targets in the world because they're sitting on Bitcoin. And so there is a concern in my head that let's say I buy those calls. And at the moment, I only have a million dollars of risk, right? So I buy a million dollars in premium. I can't get margin called because I own calls, right? Someone who's short an option can get margin called. For me, the most I can lose is that million dollars. But let's say that million dollar bet becomes a $5 million, $10 million, $20 million in the money bet. Well, then I have that exposure to Ledger X. Ledger X owes me that money. That's a lot of counterparty exposure. So what happens if Ledger X gets hacked? So they're regulated, but they're so not insured, to my knowledge. So that is a concern. That is a reason that would prevent me from wanting to buy, you know, put a huge amount of collateral there. And I, this is not a criticism of Ledger X. I think they're very professionally sure. run. You have other things arising, like cash lending. So now, if I want to go short something, for example, there's an OTC desk, Genesis, that is a, their big trading desk in the crypto world. They have a large balance sheet, and, and they now will actually lend me what air quotes, physical cryptocurrency. So what that means is if I want to short Bitcoin, I can go to the Genesis desk. I can say, I want to borrow $20 million in Bitcoin. They will transfer me the actual Bitcoin. I can then short that Bitcoin. By short, I could just sell it. I then get cash. Right. The cash goes in my bank account and I can't get margin called on that. So Genesis can margin call me, but they don't have my cash or my Bitcoin. Mm. And so nothing kind of malicious or unsurprised, or there can't be any, any surprises. I can't get margin called due to some weird market activity. So that's a much more attractive way for me to short now. And that only arose basically two months ago. And you were a creative guy, Ari. I, I uh, listened to a few of your interviews before. I'm very satisfied so far. So let's continue with that question I had about the futures market and, uh, correlations. and correlations. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? Again, I'm very interested in your so also listening to you talk, it makes me, it stresses me out a little bit thinking about your position. Like, you know, being in your position, I'm curious. I mean, every fund manager has experienced a stress. A stress is a requirement for success. I'm curious how this experience right now is for you, being a pioneer in this space. And, uh, you know, talking to your friends who trade in traditional markets right now or who are managers of other funds, how does that differ and sort of what does this feel like for you? Interesting question. So it's not a CNBC question. Yeah, so, so I'd say this. So launching Block Tower, which um, I did with my co-founder, Matthew Getz, we left our jobs in July. We, it was an extremely fast hedge fund launch. We were working 18-hour days in parallel to launch August 15th. So six weeks, we launched the fund. We've now grown to eight people. We're hiring eight more in the next two months. We're at the weird intersection of a growth company and a traditional financial firm. So we want to be best in practice in every regard in terms of being, you know, attention to detail matters. So regulatory compliant, legal compliance, having operations that are tight. Security is paramount. We obsess over security. And yet, we're also a growth company. So we're trying to hire extremely quickly. We're trying to grow. We're trying to be industry leaders in the space. And I'd say that intersection, what's been interesting to me is I wasn't naive about the challenges of running a hedge fund. Coming from UChicago, UChicago invests in hundreds of investment firms, and I've underwritten some of them myself. So I was pretty familiar with the space. Still, I was amazed at how much operational work there is. So we were at a point in our growth about six weeks ago where we had a team of seven, and five of those people were on the operation side and only two on the investment side, which is kind of incredible. You think a seven-person team is a hedge fund, only two are investors. But that's how much operational work there is. So dealing with investor relations, regulatory compliance, all of that. So now we, we're beefing up both sides of the organization. How does that compare if you were, if you were a traditional fund? So it's more balanced. It really, really depends on the type. I'll give you an example. So my former employer, Susquehanna International Group, there was a point where they had 200 traders and they had 900 other staff members. Mm. So the other staff was everything from HR. It was a lot of algorithmic programmers, 
electrical engineers who would do things like produce the trading infrastructure that the traders would use. But the people actually making the trading decisions were only about 15, 20% of the firm. Mm. That's how much kind of support staff you needed. And it's calling them support staff is maybe unfair because they're a critical part of the organization. One reason we're so heavy on the operational staff is just the speed. So there's some things you only have to do once. You only have to create a PPM, a private placement memorandum once. You only have to deal with the lawyers on that once. Mm. We were fundraising from a great number of partners and onboarding each one. Again, that's not something we're not going to be continuing at that pace. We were kind mm. of racing to get up and running. With that said, there, you know, it, it's a operationally intensive business. So when you ask about, about kind of how has it been for me and, and stress and things, I stress out for sure about the portfolio, about risks in both directions. It's kind of funny. So there's obviously the risk of capital loss, but there's also the risk of underperforming on the upside. So we hold a lot of cash. We obsess over risk. And so what about when the entire market is going parabolic? Well, that's also stressful, right? Right. Am I capturing that the opportunity? brings us to the benchmark, the fact that you have all these different benchmarks that you're really up against, yeah. which is really interesting. You put yourself in career pickle. But it's also stressful dealing with being an entrepreneur, right? Growing right. a firm, dealing with hiring new sure. people and all the aspects that come with just you know growing a business. It's super impressive, man. What you're doing is super impressive and exciting. You're really sort of at the vanguard of something brand new, and you get to learn a tremendous amount by putting yourself at the deep end of the pool like this. Counterparty risk, exchange risk, a very unusual set of risk factors for you guys that other funds don't have to deal with. I mean, the fact that you do have to worry about having the exchange being hacked on which you currently have open positions or whatever else. Do you put a lot of your, your is a lot of the crypto that you own personally, is that in cold storage? How do you guys manage that? How do you basically mitigate the unusual risk characteristics of this market? Yeah. So- Anyone who's not actively trading, none of your cryptocurrency should be on exchange. What I highly recommend everyone is buy a hardware wallet. So for example, the Nano Ledger or the Trezor, they look like USB sticks and they are industry best practice to store cryptocurrency and they're quite secure. Because we're active traders, we need to have some cryptocurrency on exchanges so that we can react quickly. We very consciously underwrite the individual exchanges and counterparties. We're very conscious about the risk we're taking. So at any given time, we typically have about 20% of our fund, more like 15% actually, on exchanges, and that's spread out over six exchanges. And there's some exchanges we won't trade on because we don't think, I mean, ultimately, it never makes sense to look at risk in isolation. It's always risk versus return. So for example, if you tell me that there's an exchange that's 50-50 to go under in the next year, I might still put some money on it if I'm confident that the returns are worth putting 2% of my capital at risk. Mm-hmm. So it's not that things are too risky or not or, or not risky. It's always or we're underwriting the risk as traders. So I say, okay, this is an exchange where we're going to earn a ton of money for our LPs. We're willing to risk 3% of AUM and have that sitting on the exchange. And we think by having it sitting there, if there's a flash crash, if the market is moving really quickly, there's an opportunity we can exploit. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. You said how many exchanges do you trade on? Uh, about six actively so right now. So how important is arbitrage for you? Because there are large significant discrepancies between exchanges, particularly in some of these Asian markets where people are having a hard time getting their money out. How are you capitalizing on those? Are you are you able to sort of... So we don't, we're not focused on arbitrage. My view on that was I don't want us to build a business where someone like a Citadel or Rentec, these giant financial firms that are optimized for that, if and when they get into the crypto game, they could be better than us at that the mm, next day. That's smart. So I don't want to build a business where we're competing against the world's best in their game, right? That's pretty smart. Um, now, with that said, we have been doing some arbitrage because, hey, if it's low-hanging fruit and it's there and I can exploit it and I have money sitting on exchanges already, why not? So in December, there were some great opportunities. We did take advantage of them. That's not a core business for us. It's a very small percentage of what we do. And it's specifically because I don't, I can't tell you that I'm better at that than everyone else in the world. So what is, where do you have a competitive advantage? I think at the intersection between crypto fundamental understanding, trading expertise, and relationships. It's, it's, it's like a triangle. Can you define crypto fundamental understandings? Uh, Do you just mean generally yes. your broad understanding and depth in understanding cryptocurrency, the technology, and the sort of ecosystem? This is probably easiest with an example. So I am non-technical. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a cryptographer. I don't claim if someone was in the room and they said they're a cryptocurrency expert, they probably know more than I do. What I try to do is- I don't think you've been to enough crypto meetups in New York City. Uh, maybe right. not. Maybe not. But um, So I, I claim really no cryptocurrency expertise. What, what we do is we talk to the world's best. We talk to the best blockchain engineers, the best developers. And, and what I mean by that is we're talking to the creators of the cryptocurrencies, uh-huh. the lead developers of the projects. Sure. And when they disagree with one another, I'm not making a bet. 
So, so if, if two of the world's best blockchain engineers disagree on a database architecture, who am I to decide between them? But often what happens is all of the developers, all the engineers will tell you one thing and the market says something else. And that's because this is a 95% retail market where people have no idea what they're buying. No. And so if all the engineers tell me, for example, that Ethereum, Ether, which is one of the leading cryptocurrencies, is nearing capacity, that it's about to be clogged as a network, they all tell me that. There's no special insight there, but the market has no idea. I can see the average retail trader, the average investor is totally unaware of this. That might present an opportunity for us to make a bet because then we have enough of a fundamental understanding of what's going on and we know how to think like traders. So I can structure a trade. Let me give us a very specific example of one of our best trades. In around November 17th, there was supposed to be a Bitcoin hard fork. It was called Segwit2x. It was very contentious. It was very complex. Basically, it meant that Bitcoin was going to fork into two, and there were going to be two chains that were competing. For this would have been the second brand. Bitcoin fork. Yes. So the earlier one was on August 1st called Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash. Cash. Right. Bitcoin Cash was kind of like a spinoff. It was friendly. It was called Bitcoin Cash and not Bitcoin. That's important. Exchanges gave it a different ticker symbol. It had a technological protection in it called replay protection that meant that users who didn't know anything weren't going to lose money between the two chains. And so for all those reasons, it acted like a dividend. So if you owned Bitcoin before the fork, after the fork, you actually made money because you now own very Bitcoin nice Cash dividend. and Bitcoin and acted as a dividend. And it wasn't value destroying because the two chains didn't really attack each other. The Segwit2x chain would have been a contentious hard fork where the two chains would have basically been at war. Heading into that, if it happened, it would have been the single biggest event in cryptocurrency history, it would have been the biggest event for Bitcoin. I think it would have been incredibly destructive for Bitcoin. Mm. Not everyone agree with me on that, but that Can was Can you firm. explain your thinking? Sure. So there's maybe three points of competition here. One is you take an existing network and you split it into two. Generally, the value of network effects is more than linear. So if you double the size of a network, it's more than twice as valuable. If you cut a network in half, it's less than half as valuable. With Bitcoin Cash, that wasn't the case because Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin were truly differentiated in their value proposition. It was a little bit like sometimes a company will split in two, but they're different business lines. Hmm. So there aren't really, you know, it was a conglomerate of, of kind of a mishmash of businesses. Because Bitcoin Cash was, sorry to interrupt just for the audience that may not know, is the reason because Bitcoin Cash was attempting to solve the problem of scalability in transactions. And so it was more of a transaction currency, whereas Bitcoin, the original actually was, if you wanted to store value, it was it was more for that? Exactly. So Bitcoin Cash was trying to optimize for transaction throughput, for low cost, high throughput transactions. Mm -hmm. And Bitcoin was trying to optimize for decentralization and security mm -hmm. to support the store value use case. The communities were also kind of at each other's throats. Within mm -hmm. the Bitcoin community before that hard fork, you kind of had two camps that mm -hmm. were fighting. So by separating those two, you could argue that it kind of became mm. you know, a more valuable networks, mm. more consistent in their vision. With Segwit2x, the 2x hard fork was a very, very minor change in a literal sense. It only doubled the block size, whereas Bitcoin Cash basically increased it more than 8x. So the 2x would have been a relatively minor change. It wasn't really a differentiated value proposition. Mm. It would have been competing for the brand. And that's huge, because imagine if there's an exchange in the US and another exchange in the US, and Bitcoin, what, what is called Bitcoin, and what gets the ticker symbol BTC on one, is a different product than what gets that symbol on the other. The confusion that would have created would have been tremendous. Wow. It would have led to probably a very large loss of funds and a loss of confidence. If you have a retail investor, right, someone goes home to Thanksgiving, they tell their uncle, hey, you should buy Bitcoin, and that individual just bought Bitcoin. Well, maybe I bought Bitcoin for $5,000, and you bought Bitcoin for 2000 because it's literally a different thing. And most of the people don't, everything we just discussed, very few people, even of the people who own Bitcoin, they don't understand this, they don't know this. Many people would have gotten confused. And then there's also this technical issue of a replay attack where people could actually lose money due to malicious attacks that would have been possible between these two chains. So I think it would have been very disruptive. So something that we did as an investment firm is we spent a lot of time heading into that talking to all the key players. So I was a poker player at a professional level in college and I like, as a trader, I was kind of trained to think of trading as a poker game. So who are the key players? What cards do they hold? What do they think is, in practice, what this meant was talking to Coinbase and Zappo and BitPay and BitGo and, and Chinese mining pools, the key players in the Bitcoin ecosystem, to understand what is their positioning? Do they have a lot of Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash? How are they positioned as a business? What do they think will happen? What do they want to happen? And how will they react to different scenarios? So we gathered all that information, and frankly, we didn't have a clear view on what was likely to happen. When Segwit2x was called off about a week before it was intended to go live, suddenly everything kind of clicked for me, and we put on a trade where we bought Bitcoin Cash. And Bitcoin Cash mm. is kind of a tangent. So this was Bitcoin Cash hard forked and was born on August 1st. This hard fork was Bitcoin separating into Bitcoin and Bitcoin2x. Sure. So why would I buy Bitcoin Cash? And the reason is a lot of the Bitcoin community who favored larger blocks, who favored high throughput, low fee transactions, mm. were betting on Segwit2x. 
they were saying, okay, Bitcoin Cash, we don't really know or care. We're waiting for Segwit2x. So the moment Segwit2x was called off, I thought that entire camp is now going to shift to favoring oh, Bitcoin cool. Cash. And sure enough, that's what happened, and Bitcoin Cash went up 5x over the next two weeks. So that trade, what was our edge? How do I even describe it? Well, I think you know we needed a decent fundamental understanding of the hard forks themselves, but it's not like I had a better understanding of that than you know, I'm sure you could find hundreds of engineers who knew it as well as I did or better. But it was also this understanding of the game theory, putting the time in to develop the relationships and, and meet the players and talk to them. And then how do you construct a trade? How's the, you know, understanding market psychology, understanding how markets work. When you look out into the world where other people see sort of binary outcomes, it seems to me that you see a probabilistic function. Yeah, I, I certainly try to. Well, it certainly sounds, I mean, more like it. I mean, obviously that's, uh, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I credit my first employer or first employer after college, Susquehanna International Group. So it was a firm that was founded by poker players. I played a lot of poker in college. Obviously, as a poker player, you have to think probabilistically. You're always thinking it, people often think that odds play a bigger role in poker than they do. They're just kind of an entry point. Like like any reasonably smart person could learn all the odds you need to know to play a decent game of poker in about an hour. It's very simple. But you learn to think probabilistically, right? Because you're always waiting on that next card. You're always mm -hmm. trying to think, what are my pot odds? What what are the odds I get that that flush on the river? So you think probabilistically. You know the future's uncertain. You know that no matter how good you are, you're very likely to lose a hand against a bad player. It's you know the best player doesn't even necessarily win any more hands against a bad player. They maximize their wins. They minimize their losses. So I, I thought probabilistically from poker. As a trader, I was trained very, very much to think probabilistically. And I think it's especially important in cryptocurrency because the assets are so hyper volatile, right? We're talking about assets that can easily rally 4x in a month. I mean, Bitcoin was $800 last November. It's now It now just crashed down to 10,000, right. right? What a ridiculous statement, right? It was $800, it crashed down to 10,000. So you have to think probabilistically in this market. If you just say, oh, I think Bitcoin is eventually gonna conquer the world, certainly as, as someone who's managing other people's money, that's not a great way to view things because on the path, on the path from 10 cents to $10,000, Bitcoin's crashed 80% five separate times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which also kind of brings us to something that I do want to touch on at some point, which is how do you think about, because, you know, a retracement or a consolidation of this market looks very different than it does in a traditional equity market. And that, you know, I wonder, you know, in changing market conditions, how you incorporate that. And I'm interrupting you. And uh, there's one thing, more thing I want to ask you, though, before we move into anything else or before you answer that question, because I just remembered it. I'm curious your process like when you're sitting around thinking through a dilemma or a problem, this is a perfect example, right? Segwit2x. And you're trying to find sort of the play here, the position. What is, you know, how do you want to position yourself? What's the opportunity? I'm curious, besides the, the modeling, what you did when you said it all just came together and you said it's, you know, the play is Bitcoin Cash. I'm curious how you experienced that all coming together and what that process was, because that's, I think, what you know, is so exciting about what you're doing and the business that you're in is you get to have those moments and you get to play on the edge there. Yeah, I'll kind of extrapolate this to like a life philosophy of mine. So I think a good approach to life is most of the time you want to be relatively conservative. You grind, you put in the work, you learn, you study, you gain the skills. And then every once in a while, a fat pitch lines up. And by once in a while, I mean once a decade. Maybe it's once a lifetime. It depends on the scale we're talking. And then you swing for the fences. And then and then you have to be willing to take risk. You have to be in, in poker. You have to be willing to shove your chips in. You have to be willing to go all in. In life, that means maybe leaving your job and joining a startup. As a trader, it means maybe that's the time when you make the big bet. Mm. And so... That was true for me career-wise in terms of building skills, you know, following a relatively conservative path when I wasn't super clear on kind of what the right choice was. And then it was leaving to launch a crypto fund as quickly as we can, throwing all of my own money in it, throwing, you know, all the career risk in it. And similarly, that's how I think about the portfolio. So because we're positioned in a more risk-averse way, all in for us is not all in in terms of 100% of the money into a trade. So in this example, I really like the trade. I thought it was a home run. We put 15% of the portfolio in it. So all in mm. does not necessarily mean you know a crazy bet. but That's a good um, chunk. Well, it's, it's a good chunk. And, and it was a very, very risky trade with a somewhat binary outcome. So Bitcoin Cash, basically a very small number of people owned it and were promoting it. And if they had abandoned it, I thought it could basically head towards zero very quickly. Mm. So it was, it was something of a binary outcome 
very few things are really binary outcomes, but uh, I think that's actually And you have less data to go off of, too. I mean, there's less, you know, there's more of a, your your gut is playing a bigger role in this market. I mean, that's my instinct, and that's why I keep going back to these qualitative questions, right? These are very, you know, I didn't even plan to ask you these. They're mm-hmm. just coming up as I'm sitting here against, across another human being who's in a position to make millions of dollars off trades in a very short period of time, given the volatility in this market, and you have to make these very adult decisions, and you have to put on your big boy pants and do it, and I I just think you know it's an interesting thing that keeps popping back into my head. How do you do that, especially given the fact that you don't have this giant roadmap to go off of? You know, it's funny. I get asked a lot. How do you basically how do you invest in cryptocurrency without historical data? And to me, it's a really weird question because when I was at the endowment of Chicago, I got shown a lot of back tests. In finance, everyone obsesses over analyzing historical data, partly because it's there because you can. So if you're a grad student trying to get a PhD in econ, the easiest thing to do is you do some slightly marginal analysis looking or the same analysis someone else did on a new data set. And it's because you can. You can spend three years doing mm. that. You can calculate something out to three decimal points. Mm. The reality is that may or may not have any value in predicting the future. So does the fact that we'll be going to – I mean – the biggest mistake investors make tends to be extrapolating the past. Mm. So in the 60s, everyone said, oh, IBM's growing at 25% a year. We can come up with a fundamental argument why it's the best company in the world and we'll keep doing that. And towards the end, if you had extrapolated that in another 15 years, IBM would have been worth more than every other company on the planet. You get these very clear, absurd outcomes that, that seem somewhat rational that are just extrapolations of the past. We can calculate what the U.S. equity risk premium is. We can say, okay, over 100 years, the U.S. has averaged whatever, 6.5% excess returns. And let's say you calculate it and your modeling says 6.6 and mine says 6.4. Like my argument is that doesn't matter at all. That margin of error, that 0.2%, is so tiny relative to the forward-looking error, relative to the real question we need to ask is, okay, we have a rough idea what the past looked like. What is going to be different about the future? And does that difference make us want to double our estimate, cut it in half? You know, So in cryptocurrency, it's that but much more extreme, which is to say the biggest question I'm constantly asking is what will the next regime look like? What fundamentally is changing about cryptocurrency that will make the future not resemble the past at all? So you're talking about market regime. I, I want to get into that. It's interesting also what you're bringing up. You're touching on portfolio theory, and it's actually something that came up in my last conversation with uh, Chris Berniski. And you know Chris, and you know Joel Monegro. They're fantastic. Partners. They're yeah, friends. And, and they're super smart guys. And But one of the things I did question Chris on was how much does he depend on, because he uses a lot of portfolio theory. I mean, there's, that's kind of in his book a lot. And that is, of course, looking at the past and sort of building building on the future and sort of thinking statistically in that sort of a sense in, in a bell distribution kind of a Gaussian way. So that's interesting that you say that. You make a really good point on that. So you're talking about changing market regimes. Talk to me a little bit more about why you brought that up. Sure. It's at the center of how I think about cryptocurrency and, and frankly, how I think about investing in general, even in the non-cryptocurrency assets. The difference is that a regime change in, say, U.S. equities might happen once every decade or 20 years. Depends on regime is a very wishy-washy word. It can refer to a lot of things. But, for example, we had a 30-year bond bull market. So if you were waiting for the next bond regime, it's literally your entire career might have gone by in one regime. Mm -hmm. So we have a generation of investors and traders who've never seen a bond bear market. What does real estate do? What do correlations look like? Mm. How do commodities do in a bond bear market? Like, Mm -hmm. we can look at what they did 40 years ago, but obviously it's a different world economy now, right? Like, trying to draw a lesson from how copper and and real estate interacted 40 years ago, we might learn the wrong lessons, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, even the construction of real estate might use way more or less copper than it did Mm -hmm. 40 years ago. So in cryptocurrency, it's the same idea, just instead of a 40-year time frame, you have like a three-month time frame. Mm. It's incredible how fast. So you mentioned kind of the toolkit, right? So now you have CME and CBOE futures. How's that going to change market microstructure? How's that going to change the volatility? Is it going to make things more or less volatile? These are questions that I think are more important than analyzing what a standard deviation of Bitcoin was three years ago. Mm. And on that one, by the way, I guess since I raised the question, I should try to answer it. I don't think it's really clear cut. My guess is the way the futures and derivatives on Bitcoin, I think the effect they're going to have is they're going to mute very short-term volatility. You're going to have more market makers deeper order books, people who soak up some of that very short-term extreme. So without market makers, what happens is one person wants to buy $30 million of Bitcoin, and they sweep it up 5% or 10%. Mm. With market makers, that $50 million order doesn't move things, so you get less very short-term volatility. But the month-to-month volatility, I don't think falls at all, because that's fundamentally driven. Now, also, with guys like you entering the space, in general, there's more money coming in. The ecology is changing. And up until now, this market has been closed off. It's been very siloed, right? But you're beginning to get leakage into it from the broader market. And that's going to lead to some level of correlation. So then that's kind of another way of getting into asking you what your broader perspective is on markets more broadly. Let's kind of zoom out here. And then also, how do you think does that impact 
market movements in Bitcoin, like what would be the impact of, let's say, a breakout in inflation or uh, a deflationary spiral in the economy or a recession? How would all those things impact the cryptocurrency space? And how do you think about all that? Yeah, so at the end of the day, the price of an asset is driven by supply and demand. Stupidly simple statement, right? But order flow, um, which broadly just means who's buying, who's selling, is so critical to understand asset prices. So, And this is true in every level. So if, if you asked me, where will U.S. equities be in a decade, I think I would care less about macro things, like how much did the U.S. GDP grow, what are profit margins companies. I think if I could only ask one question, my question would probably be something like, what is the savings rate? or what percentage of people's income are they putting into retirement accounts? Because that tells you how much money is flowing in passively, how much money mm -hmm. is going into 401ks. So you have all these people who, they're not looking at P ratios. They're saying, okay, I'm going to put 5% of my monthly income into my 401k, and I'm going to passively buy the S&P mm -hmm. 500. And that so dramatically impacts the price to earnings ratios of stocks. Mm -hmm. In cryptocurrency, it's even more extreme because there is no quantifiable, straightforward, intrinsic value. So Chris Berniski has done phenomenal work pushing us towards some kind of quantification. But he's very practical and reasonable about this. What he's providing us with is, is a model, a mental framework. And mm -hmm. he puts precise numbers to it, but he's saying smart enough as an understatement. He, he fully understands that it's kind of garbage in, garbage out, that he's just providing a mental framework, mm -hmm. and the numbers are somewhat arbitrary. Right. Um, we're just throwing a dart on the map, and we're starting somewhere. So we, I spent a lot of time thinking about questions like, here's a really simple example. So six months ago, no. 12 months ago, South Korea and Japan were a relatively small part of the cryptocurrency market. Mm -hmm. If you looked at both real buying and exchange volume, it was basically US and China. Mm -hmm. China now is something like 5% of the market in terms of exchange volume. It's more than that, I think, in terms of buying power. It's a large percentage of Bitcoin hash power. But China's become a much smaller piece. South Korea and Japan are huge. South Korea is about a third of the global cryptocurrency market now, in all regards. How does that change That's sense? interesting, and there's a huge opportunity there. For, when I was talking about arbitrage, that's a huge arbitrage opportunity there. But go ahead. I didn't yeah. So I, I'll answer the uh, neglected answer your arbitrage question. So the Korean arbitrage, basically no one can do at scale. So individual Koreans can pull $50,000 a year out in mm. Wan. The way it often works is someone with a family member who has a business there, which maybe has some kind of export license. They can pull a little more out. So, so there was a point where you could have traded a billion dollars of Bitcoin at a 40% premium. You could have made wow. $400 million if you had the ability to get Korean won out of Korea. No one was able to do it, mm -hmm. to my knowledge. So what are the sorts of arbitrages you can do in Korea right now? So there are arbitrages you can do in Korea. So you can do, for example, what's called triangle arbitrage. So for example, I could transfer Bitcoin to a Korean exchange, convert it into Ether, bring the Ether back to the US, and convert that back into Bitcoin. So if the Bitcoin Ether pair spread is different in Korea versus the US, I can arbitrage it. What I can't do is arbitrage fiat. I can't arbitrage Korean won versus US dollar prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. So back to the macro perspective and sort of the broader economy, that sort of gets into this question of when are we going to see a change in market regime? The market has uh, up until, I mean, we had 2008 to 2012 to Mario Draghi's speech, we pretty much had this inflation deflation. After that, the markets pretty much said, okay, the Fed is the only game in town, central banks are the only game in town, lever up as long as rates are low. Rates have been rising. And now the question is, what's going to happen? There are those who think that we're going to tip back into deflation, that the economy won't be able to you know, sort of get out of this liquidity trap that we've been stuck in, that we're in the road of Japan. I've heard you take the opposite view, that you think there's actually an unrecognized level of risk that there will be inflation. And I think in that sense, you sort of share much in common with uh, Christopher Cole, who we've had on the show before. How would you respond to that, and how does that affect your trading right now? Yeah, so first let me say almost no one is good at global macro in traditional markets. There's almost no one in the world with a decent hit rate. In fact, there's no one in the world who's more than 70% on calling interest rate direction. So the world's best bond traders, the world's best interest rate traders, they will readily admit that they're maybe a little better than a coin flip at calling which way interest rates are going to go, which way inflation is going to go. It's incredibly hard. So I, anything I say in that regard is very, I offer humbly. But that was one of the reasons I got into cryptocurrency. So 2008 crisis hit, the US Federal Reserve started printing insane amounts of money. So the base money supply increased 4x. Mm -hmm. The amount of US dollars circulating increased fourfold. And the reason that didn't produce big inflation was because the velocity of money fell, mm -hmm. and lending rates by banks fell, and borrowing demand by companies fell. But my thinking in 2009 was, I know this, I'm a student of economic history, and I know this is not going to immediately produce inflation. The deflationary impact of 2008 is gigantic. We also have things like automation that are deflationary in nature. They put downward pressure on wages. Demographics, too. Demographics. So I knew that there wasn't going to be inflation anytime soon, but I'm like, okay, at some point, this massive money printing that isn't just the US, it's the world, is going to make me not want to own fiat. I'm not going to want to US dollars or euros or yen. And what do I want to own that can't be depreciated, that can't be printed into oblivion? So 
that kind of set me on searching for something like Bitcoin that is supply constrained. This is 2008. You were concerned about inflation at the time. Yeah, I really, it was 2009 I started thinking about it, but I knew that I had time. I knew I didn't call for inflation in 2009. In fact, the opposite. I said, like, there were people at the time saying the Fed just quadrupled the money supply. You know, we're Most definitely. So I, I was smart enough to know that we had at least a couple of years. Can I ask you something yeah. about that, Ari? Because I remember that time very well, and there were many people that were convinced we were going to have inflation. What in your sort of personal education gave you the conviction that we were going to have deflation? So to think we were going to have inflation, you need a really simplistic economic model of basically money gets printed and that causes prices to go mm -hmm. up. If you look at any kind of historical money printing episode in history, there are so many historical examples where a central bank printed tons of money. Japan is, Japan the, classic is the classic one and one. failed to get inflation. Right. And so if you just dive a little bit into why and you then see the importance of bank lending, demand for – in fact, a huge part of inflation is demand driven. So the fact that banks are showering money on people – it's almost never enough. The fact that central banks are printing money is almost never enough to cause inflation. You need laborers to demand higher wages and to be able to demand it, and you need businesses to be borrowing. Yeah, you need a demand and you multiplier. Need, yeah, you need the banking system to be able to create multiples above that base money. But go ahead. I just wanted to ask you about that. Yeah, um, yeah. So I knew we had time, but I was starting to kind of look for it and think for it. There's a really important distinction to be made here that there's no like good academic way of distinguishing. So people say inflation or they say currency depreciation. And if I say currency depreciation, that implies versus something. So if I say the US dollar is going to depreciate, the next question you should ask me is against what? Against do you mean the euro is going to go up? Do you mean the yen is mm -hmm. going to go up? And I actually say my call starting in 2010, which was this will not happen yet, but at some point probably in a year or two or three, it was there's going to be massive, massive currency depreciation, not against anything any other currency. So what does that mean? It meant that I thought that the US dollar and the euro and the yen were all going to depreciate relative to real assets. So relative to real estate and commodities. And I think we've seen that. So mm. the, the kind of bubble air quotes in basically everything is rallying, right? Stocks, real estate, commodities. And you look at treasury bonds, right? So in the US, we have somewhat reasonable interest rates, but much of Europe has zero or negative interest rates. Right. You think about the absurdity of like Someone is paying the government of Germany right. to borrow their money for five or 10 years. I'm paying uh, you to take my money. It's absurd to me that you have financial experts and, and heads of banks calling Bitcoin a bubble and not calling paying someone to borrow to take your money a mm. bubble. Like that is such a clear the, bubble. The, the, what you're saying, a bubble here is the fiat system is a bubble based on what you're saying. Yes. So what we've seen is, and I think that is the current, this massive currency depreciation that I think is going to accelerate. So what does that mean? So we're now at this weird point where people don't want to own fiat, but stocks look pretty rich. Real estate looks pretty rich. So what can rally without looking absurdly overpriced relative to currency? So I can tell you like right now, I, I still like cryptocurrency. I, I like gold as kind of another bet on that. Do you have a, a target for 2000? Do you think that we might see that in the next year? Oh, in, in the price gold? of gold? Yeah. I don't have an exact price. Timing these things, so slightly broader, the US is under attack as global reserve currency. Mm. I think it's very likely to lose that status. This tend, currencies being knocked off their pedestal tends to take far longer than people expect. Mm. So you have really, really clearly unsustainable paradigms, whether it's like the Bank of England when Soros broke the bank. Mm. People were calling for that five, 10 years. What tends to happen in currencies is there's a really clear dynamic. Everyone knows a peg's gonna get broken. Traders give up on it. They try to make that bet one year after another, and eventually they give up, and then it ends up happening mm. 10 years <laughs> down the line. So I'm wary of trying to pick a time. Um, there right. are a lot of people, like, you look at the, one of the reasons I'm bullish on gold right now is that for five years, people have been bullish on gold for the same reasons I'm bullish right now, and they've almost given up. So the sentiment is people are just like, they've given you've up. You've called, you've, you know, getting back to this sort of notion of ecology, a lot of alpha driven investors have also gotten really, they've sort of died out of this ecosystem because they were. You know, the beta has done so well. The market has done so well, and if you've chased alpha, you've had a really hard time. So that, I mean, I mean that makes sense. What you're saying. Also, by the way, we had Robert Johnson on the show. You mentioned Soros and the trade. We talked about that trade. We talked about the, the breaking the Bank of England. So let's say we have a recession. You're saying that in the midst of a recession, you don't expect to see a negative knock-on effect on asset prices. I think it'll depend entirely on whether it's an inflationary or deflationary recession. So most recessions are deflationary. Mm. Um, I, I don't know, like off the top of my head, I'll say 80%. Um, I actually don't, I'm making up that number, sure, but, sure, but, sure. but certainly the vast majority for good reason. It's not that easy to have an inflationary recession. And I could see either happening in a deflationary recession where the recession is basically a global slowdown of growth, general wealth destruction, which could be caused by a lot of things, could be caused by war, political turmoil, just a, a general cyclical type recession. I expect all asset prices to be hurt. So I would expect cryptocurrency to be hurt at the margin. Now, a thing to understand with cryptocurrency is the idiosyncratic volatility is so gigantic 
for example, like Ceteris Paribus, all things being equal, let's say we think that due to money flows, cryptocurrency will 2x in 2018. If you then tell me there's going to be a recession, then maybe I say it only goes up 20%. Mm. So I'm not saying that it goes down because that correlation is pretty low. But all things being equal, I think if equities are down, probably cryptocurrency goes down. That relationship is very likely to strengthen over time. So two years ago, the people who owned cryptocurrency, it was a Facebook engineer who looked at the price once a day, who had maybe a couple hundred grand in Bitcoin, and who had a day job. And that wasn't a huge part of their portfolio, most likely. And so they weren't rebalancing. They weren't saying, oh, my Bitcoin's up. I'm going to sell some and I'm going to buy equities. It was just kind of a hobby. It was a thing on the side. As more institutional money flows into cryptocurrency, you're going to see what you started to see. So before, call it 2004, commodities were not really part of portfolios for the most part. If they were, it was more in the equity sense. So, so people would own a stake in a gold mining company. They would right. own a stake in a natural gas driller. What happened 2004 through 2006 was the suddenly commodities, passive exposure to the actual physical commodity became kind of okay to have in a portfolio. So you had ETFs, ETFs. yeah. So you had ETFs like USO and UNG that became gigantic. Pensions Mm -hmm. started passively owning crude oil. Mm -hmm. And that changed the market dynamic. It changed the correlation because Mm -hmm. suddenly if a pension has 5% of the portfolio in crude oil and 95% in things that are highly correlated equities, then what happens is when the 95% falls, they then rebalance. Mm. And so that causes them to sell crude oil. Mm. And, and they're, they're price insensitive sellers. They're not selling for fundamental reasons. Mm. They just push the price down because other stuff went down. Call it a wealth effect mm. or a rebalancing effect. So we don't see that that much yet in cryptocurrency. I think we will increasingly as crypto becomes part of institutional portfolios. Mm-hmm. You know, I could geek out with you on the macro stuff all day. But in the interests of time, I want to ask you more specifically what sort of plays you think are most interesting in this space right now? Are there things that you can share that you're looking at? And there are any things that a sort of someone who's obviously not invested in a fund, doesn't have a professional money manager managing their, their money that they would look to do, and not just generally, but also specifically in the crypto space? So my advice on this is pretty similar to when I used to have relatives ask me about trading, say, equity options, which was my first role at Susquehanna. You don't want to compete against professionals at their own game. So I, in my own portfolio, I don't buy individual equities because it's a full-time job. So there are people who are world-class at it, who spend 80 hours a week doing nothing but stock picking. Why do I think I can beat them as a hobbyist, right? And that, and that's that's something I do have some expertise in, right? So why would someone want to play against me picking individual crypto or actively trading <laughs> cryptocurrencies, right? It's not to say they can't make money, but it's just not an attractive game to be in. It's not that I'm smarter than them, but if you're a surgeon, you're a brilliant surgeon, but you're doing surgery 60 hours a week, like okay, well, maybe you could be better than me at this, but you're not doing it full time. Mm. There's a lot of pitfalls. There's a lot of easy ways to lose a lot of money, whether it's exchange counterparty risk, security failures, where you have your coins stolen because you stored them improperly. Those are huge. Um, Outright scams. So a huge number of people right now are losing money. A lot of them don't know they've lost it yet, but it's lost. Buying into worthless ICOs, initial coin offerings. And I say they don't know it's lost because either that ICO has not become exchange listed yet, so there is no market price, or there's a market price, but there's no liquidity. It's totally crazy. Yeah. Do you think it's, I mean, to me, this is a mania unlike anything I've seen. This isn't comparable to the late 90s where you actually had companies that had products and actually had revenue. Here, you don't even have, in many cases, you don't even have a product demo. You have a piece of paper with some ideas on it and maybe some math, if you're lucky. And you have people being able to raise billions of dollars from the market. What accounts for that? How much of that do you think is also a reflection of the forces we were describing before, the low interest rates and the high levels of income inequality, not income, wealth particularly, wealth inequality, and the fact that this offers the first opportunity for a whole generation of people to get exposure to that lottery ticket. Yeah, I I think that last part is really critical. So part of this is a result of regulation that precludes individuals who are not accredited investors from participating in venture capital. And so if you're that individual, it's like, well, the US government is not allowing you access to something that could give you a 10x return. You literally are not allowed to participate in attractive investments. Such a good point. And so this may look attractive to you. Another thing, like I think a lot of this comes down to really basic human psychology. So the ICO market is going to have nine lives. I expect it to collapse and then be reborn and collapse and be reborn again. The reason is that it's incredibly attractive as a get-rich-quick scheme for developers. And it's incredibly attractive as a get-rich-quick scheme for investors because it is a lottery ticket. And it's a lottery ticket that provides liquidity very, very quickly. So I think what's likely to happen is the regulators are starting to crack down increasingly. 
the current wave of ICOs may, sooner or later, you'll have a crash and you'll have a freeze, and then it'll be reborn in a slightly different form. So you're going to have actually correctly registered security offerings. It may be offered on decentralized exchanges based in locales that support it. So for example, you may have development teams moving to wherever it is, Cayman Islands or Zug, Switzerland, or you know wherever they feel safe doing it, and then they'll be able to sell those tokens on decentralized, or, or they'll, be, they'll become listed on decentralized exchanges. It's not going to be easy to stamp this out, and a lot of people are going to lose money over the next, I think, three to five years. You know, before I read Chris Berniski's, initially his paper on the equation of exchange, and then his book, and then having him on the program, and also I was looking really to understand where I fell. Where did I really put Bitcoin as a value proposition? Did I see it? that it had an upside opportunity, that there was really something there? And where did I rank Ethereum and sort of these, the utility layer, more the utility protocol, and then the the sort of the layer of dApps? I actually, you know, not to come out and say this, I'm certainly going to make a definitive statement here, but the one thing that I actually think people don't see it as risky enough is Ethereum. I actually think the really, for me, the one of the really great opportunities is identifying teams that are building decentralized applications that might be able to scale with a utility protocol that has not been invented yet or has not come out yet. So I think you can get exposure to some of those if you know what you're doing. I think Bitcoin actually has a use case as a store of value, but I don't know how to price it as much as I've looked at it. But I think Ethereum for me is one of those things that people are underappreciating the risk that it will be replaced as a foundational utility protocol. I wonder uh, I, what you think of all that. Yes. Okay. So first, let me say, no one knows anything. An amazing thing about cryptocurrency right now is when you're valuing companies, whether the VC or traditional perspective, there's at least a business there or a prospective business. And it's not winner take all. We're not going to end up with a world with one company, right? There is room even within an area like social networking. You can have both a LinkedIn and a Facebook, and you can even have more niches, and you can have second place and third place winners. With cryptocurrency, a big question is, is to what degree is this going to look like a winner take all world? Are there going to be a thousand valuable cryptocurrencies or 10? Is it going to follow a power law? Is it going to? These are questions that are fundamentally, I think, somewhat unknowable because there's a lot of individual pieces that you have to solve for. And some of those pieces, here's an example of something that no one knows. We don't know if there's a viable consensus mechanism, a consensus system alternative to proof of work. So Ethereum is looking to transition to proof of stake. You have things like Ripple that have distributed proof of stake. You have proof of space time, which is a project by Graham Cohen, creator of BitTorrent. Mm -hmm. They're all experiments. We honestly don't know. And there are some really phenomenal debates between the world's best cryptographers and blockchain engineers. New code is buggy. There's no way to know a priori that new code will not be buggy. And similarly, there's no way to know that a new consensus system will work will be sound from a game theory perspective until there's billions of dollars on the line. Now, does that mean that you're on the lookout? Do you have people in the fund that are actively looking for that? Yes. So a question that I ask pretty consistently is, I like taking the base theorem approach. If you ask what could kill Bitcoin and you ask a lot of the smartest Bitcoin developers, for example, their answer is nothing. But these are some of the smartest people and they're great critical thinkers. And so I, and I kind of need to get that information from them. So the way I frame it to them as well as to myself is, let's play a game, Bayes' theorem, let's say Bitcoin mm -hmm. died, what killed it? Mm -hmm. And so my current answer, I think, is it's either a consensus mechanism that provides greater security and decentralization at less cost, mm -hmm. which we don't know if that exists, mm -hmm. but we can't say it doesn't, it won't be invented, mm -hmm. or maybe it's been invented and just not proven yet. Mm -hmm. And the other is governance mechanism. So Bitcoin has something that, I didn't invent the term, but I, there's no formal term for it, but a lot of people call governance by exit. And the idea is that if you basically if you want to change Bitcoin, you have to hard fork and leave the existing chain. If you use proof of stake or you have, you have hybrid systems like Decred that uses proof of stake and proof of work hybrid that allow for voting. And the idea is that the community can be a super majority vote, majority vote, you can set the rules however you want. There's some way to change the existing code without requiring a hard fork. We don't know if that's superior or not. It's kind of an open experiment, but it is fundamentally different. It is truly differentiated. So big picture, let me take a slight step back. I think of most cryptocurrencies are like seed stage VC investments. They're experiments, most will fail. As with any new company, most new companies fail. The more ambitious they are, the more likely they are to fail. It doesn't mean it's not a good investment. It doesn't mean it's not a good experiment. If I have a VC portfolio, right, and I buy 20, I don't like the term lottery ticket because it implies that you're just guessing, but you know, I make 20 bets on things that might kill Facebook. If one of those is a winner, I was a great investor. Mm -hmm. Most cryptocurrencies, I think Ether included, are VC style investments. Ethereum is competing on features. I think this is an important point. Ethereum will not survive without sharding. Ethereum will not survive without... So sharding is a way to scale a blockchain. It basically database. Uh, moves computations uh, off-chain. Ethereum ultimately will need to support decentralized applications. And to do that, it needs to work very differently than it works right now. 
So Ethereum in its current form will die. Everyone kind of knows and accepts that. And the question is, can Ethereum basically pivot? I'm not using the language the team would use. A lot of people in crypto would object to the language I'm using. But my view is Ethereum has a great team, a great brand, a great development community. The question, it's a little bit like Uber. Eventually, we're going to have self-driving cars. Whether Uber exists in 10 years or not depends on can they pivot to that new industry. And you can argue that they're in a great position to pivot and to remain a market leader. And I would probably agree. But if Uber survives in 10 years, it's going to look nothing like what it looks today. And I think Ethereum is kind of in the same boat. So that means Ethereum is rife for disruption. It's very, very easy for someone to produce a better Ethereum that's better on all sorts mm -hmm. of features that kills Ethereum. Bitcoin, I think, is the one exception mm. in the cryptocurrency world. I think it's not competing on features. Mm. Bitcoin is competing on longevity, stability, and security. Network effect, too. Network effect, too, but it's important to note that less than 1% of the world use cryptocurrency. Mm. So if Facebook launched Facebook coin in one day, it would have greater network effects than Bitcoin has accumulated over a decade. So let me, let me kind of finish that thought because I think mm -hmm. it's important. So the analogy here I would use is Uber has to move fast and break things. Uber has to constantly innovate or it will die. Mm. Lloyd's of London doesn't. So an ancient insurance company, it can be priced over its peers. It can have fewer features. It can be less accessible. It can have a worse UI. It may win because it's competing mostly on the fact that it's 200 years old, you know, 100 years old or whatever. Same with the JP Morgan type. JP Morgan is not really competing on features. Basically, they can be behind all their competitors as long as it's not so, so much. Same with Coca-Cola. If someone comes out with an exact replica of Coca-Cola under a different brand and it's five cents cheaper, it's not going to kill Coke because hmm. Coke's not competing on price. Right. If someone comes up with Coca-Cola that's 90% cheaper, mm. well, maybe that would do it. So when I look at Bitcoin, it's there's a line from Naval Ravikant, who's um, CEO of Angelus, a great thought leader in the space, and he says, all Bitcoin needs to do to win is survive. Mm. I don't know if that's true, but I think that's kind of the right mindset. And so I ask, well, what could kill Bitcoin? Not, you know, something with slightly lower fees isn't going to do it. Something with 10x lower fees isn't going to do it. Something with 10x the transaction capacity isn't going to do it. I think it's something, if you can get the same security and decentralization with 100x throughput or 1 100th the cost, that might do it. Well, it's also not clear if the throughput's really the issue here, and that brings us back to what Chris has done and his work on Velocity. Last question, this feeds back into what could kill the Ethereum. Are you familiar with the Hashcraft protocol consensus Yeah, algorithm? yeah, I actually just did a, a bit of a dive into it a week What do you ago. think of it? So slightly more broadly, it, so it's an implementation of a directed acyclic graph, and that's a technology that's been around for a while. Blockchains are terrible at many, many things. They're incredibly inefficient. They make mm -hmm. no sense for anything like Internet of Things. They make no sense for your coffee to talk to your microwave. Directed acyclic graphs are incredibly useful and efficient for some things. It's funny, blockchain has become almost a religious or political term. It has all these connotations. It's a database structure. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, it's a database structure. And you can have a cryptocurrency that's based on many other database structures. Is the blockchain the best structure for a decentralized cryptocurrency? I think there's some evidence it's currently the best we've ever seen. To say that nothing better will ever come along is kind of a weirdly religious statement mm -hmm. to me. Same with directed acyclic graph. It seems like it's far better than blockchains for certain use cases that have nothing to do with what we probably care most about. What do you think about the actual consensus protocol? The, forget the fact that it's a DAG. Yeah. It's actual consensus protocol. I've interviewed Lehman Baird twice. The, I bring this up, you know, because we've actually covered this on the program. I, I put on a panel in New York in October. I had Lehman on in September. And so I've covered this and I've had the, the team. I had Mance, the CEO, on the panel as well. And it's a protocol that I found extremely impressive and uh, extremely promising. Uh, of course, they need to scale it as a public ledger, but I think there are very interesting ways to do that. So I think it's really important to distinguish technologies from investments, mm. especially when we're dealing with the open source world. So the engineers behind Hashgraph are brilliant. There's no question. That's not something I can even comment on. Mm -hmm. So when I say they're brilliant, that's not even me saying they're brilliant. What mm -hmm. I'm saying is other engineers in the space that I respect have told me mm -hmm. that they're brilliant. Mm -hmm. I can't talk to them and say whether they're more or less brilliant than Vitalik. Mm -hmm. I'm not at that level. Right. It'd be like maybe me judging which of the two best neurosurgeons in the world are actually the best. Sure, sure, I can't, sure. right? So I can tell you there's a consensus among engineers that it's a great team, a brilliant team. They've been very innovative. They've invented new engineering, new cryptography. So here are the downsides of investment. So it is there's a private company behind it that holds right. patents. Swirled. And so there's a real question over, really over the application and the use case. So if we think, how valuable can a database structure be? And where does the value really come from? So let me take the extreme example. So what they have with Hashgraph is an extremely efficient database structure, potentially for communicating information. Ultimately, it's all information, right? Mm -hmm. Transferring money is transferring information. I can do that on one server. So I can beat Hashgraph on throughput on myself. Mm -hmm. Like, like I, I can literally go home and beat Hashgraph on throughput mm -hmm. by running on a centralized server. Same with any other project. So I can beat Ripple on throughput. I can beat Neo on throughput by running on one server. Mm -hmm. So what is the value proposition here? So basically, there's a spectrum of decentralization. Mm -hmm. 
anytime you move away from one single server, you're going to lose some efficiency mm -hmm. in some form, right? So at one end of the extreme, you have Bitcoin, which is on around 12,000 public nodes. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch more listening nodes, incredibly inefficient architecture. Mm -hmm. But what we get from that is, of what we've seen of the database architecture, is kind of the most secure, the most transparent mm -hmm. that exists, right? And then you have projects like Ripple or Neo that are somewhere on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So they're not fully centralized, they're not fully decentralized, and it might be a really happy medium for a lot of use cases. So the analogy I like using is insurance. I don't need a billion dollars of insurance on my quarter million dollar house. It makes no mm -hmm. sense. There's, there's, yeah. almost, there's no extra value to, for me paying that insurance premium. Similarly, why do we pay 2% or more per credit card transaction? It's not because it's hard to transmit the information. You're paying for mostly insurance. You're paying fraud protection is one of the biggest pieces. Well, I don't need fraud protection on buying Coca-Cola. So what I'm saying is I, I think on that spectrum, there are a lot of use cases for which a semi-centralized cryptocurrency makes tons and tons of sense. However, as you get really towards the centralized end, you're then competing against Amazon cloud services. And I'm skeptical that a technology is going to be very, very valuable competing against Amazon cloud services. Mm -hmm. So you need a, to beat Amazon cloud services, you need, it, it's a giant business. And so they have patents, they have some IP, which a lot of, you have a lot of sure. cryptocurrencies with zero IP. They're open source, they're forkable. So when all there is is code and there's no network effects and people are like, this thing's worth a billion dollars, my answer is, well, I literally can just copy it. And you have no network effects right. and I have no network effects. So how is your thing worth a billion? Mm -hmm. So it makes no sense to me. So Hashgraph to me is, I think that the challenge they're going to face is at some point, it's okay, it's a great technology, but if someone can implement anything similar, if they can get around the patents, they can violate the patents, if they can find a way to do something very similar. Um, That's a great point. And, you know, and the problem is that because it's centralized, because it's owned by a company, they're going to have to be really smart about incentivizing developers to work great on them. Great point. Adoption. Also, yeah. That, I mean, the second point is one that I've thought of before. The first one I hadn't thought of. I thought about it a bit in terms of China, where you know there could be Chinese developers who would just let's say don't have any reason to sort of adhere to the patent. I think that's a really interesting thing about Violate. But just from a technology standpoint, and we'll, and we'll leave it there just because we're running so much out of time, Ari, is I am very excited to see how they try and scale it. I think that it could offer a more amenable consensus protocol for things like proof of stake or an alternative ways of scaling a public ledger. So just the sort of curious person in me is very interested. And I think it's really just something that I've been watching and will continue to watch. Ari, this was freaking great. I wish we had more time. I really could have just talked to you for like another hour. You're super smart. You're a super creative guy. I wish you the best success with your fund. And I appreciate you very much coming on the program. Thanks so much for having me. And that was my episode with Ari Paul. I want to thank Ari for being on my program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stylianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Join the conversation through Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod, or send me an email at dk at hiddenforcespod.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.